And don't worry, I will not be talking about implanting chips, and it's just not going to be so popular. USB drives or the network are probably a lot easier. Less painful, too. Well, let me start with a story. So it was November 10th of last year when at 2 in the morning I received the following phone call. Hi, this is a hospital in Southern California. Your mother is in the emergency room. She needs her gallbladder removed. Also, she's a little infected, so she's a little confused, a little combative. Your father is at her bedside. He's so stressed, he's just had a heart attack. We have no idea what medications they take, what problems they have, what allergies they might have. You're 4,000 miles away. Can you help? This is the call that none of you should ever receive. And so the work we're doing at a as a nation, as a state, and in local hospitals is to ensure our families are connected to healthcare data so that our care is coordinated and safe, but also as a country, we're not going to bankrupt our economy. Because today, 17% of the gross domestic product is spent on healthcare. The United States has certainly the most healthcare in the world, but not the best healthcare in the world. So when Obama became president, he had a bold idea, which is if we invest $27 billion Admittedly, the dollar is not so good, but 27 billion, it's a lot of them. Wisely and quickly into healthcare IT that we can actually improve the engagement of patients' quality, safety, and efficiency. Now, the important idea here, because this is actually about ideas, is it wasn't just a gravy train for consultants or healthcare IT professionals, that there were policy goals we would want to achieve. You know, bits and bytes, that's just a tool. Let's actually focus on the outcome. So what we're going to do is something interesting. We're going to tell doctors and hospitals, go buy IT. And once you prove that it makes a difference, then we'll give you stimulus dollars. But only after you're using it wisely. Because you can imagine, if this was a grant program, fabulous. Let's go get more technology, an iPad in every single clinician's hands. It's not about that. There are a whole series of objective criteria the Obama administration laid out as to what it means to deliver safe, quality, efficient care, what it means to engage patients and their families, what it means to coordinate care and measure population health, and what it means to keep information Private. Let me talk about privacy for a minute. So privacy is an interesting challenge. Everyone in this room probably has a different feeling about their medical privacy. Now I admit I will be on one end of the spectrum. So I got involved in the Human Genome Project. I'm the second human to be fully sequenced. And as part of that project, I had to agree to release my entire medical record all of my phenotypical information, that is, photographs of my body, body measurements, everything you can imagine about me, and my entire genome to the world. So in fact, the 35-page consent I had to sign said, you realize that by releasing your genome to the world, at some future state, your DNA could be left at the scene of every crime. Uh, you realize that your daughter, who's 18, will now, in fact, have at least half her genome represented to the public, and every future life mate can decide if she's suitable or not. To which my daughter replied, if anyone ever did that, I would never date them to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So on my side, I have decided to contribute my data for the benefit of developing policy around security, the ethics, the investigation of how the genome could be used or misused. But others would say, no, I don't think so. I actually want to keep my data very private. In fact, maybe data could be split into different types. There's that which is, oh, you had a cold last year, who cares? There's that which is mental health, a bit more private. HIV data, domestic violence data, all of these things could be criteria by which certain individuals should see your data or not. So again, the Obama administration is spending a lot of time trying to make thoughtful policy so that your privacy can be respected 
and as each site of care sees the data you want, you get the care and the coordination you expect. So, what I want to just briefly go through is show you a couple of examples of how this all works. Okay. There's this thing called meaningful use of electronic health records. And meaningful use, a set of regulations, includes how is it that a doctor communicates with patients, sending you information in whatever communication modality you're most comfortable, a piece of paper, a phone call, an email, a website where you go to retrieve your data, sharing information after each encounter, inpatient or outpatient, so you know what was done, coordinating your care by sending data with respect to your privacy preferences to the next caregiver and making sure you know who is your care team and what is the care plan. So this is all baked into this stimulus package. This is what your doctor and hospitals have to do to engage you. But one of the interesting problems we have in the United States is we actually don't learn from our healthcare system very well. It could be that, oh, there's this drug called Vioxx, you may have heard of it, super aspirin. It was really good for people with rheumatoid arthritis except for the fact that it killed you. That was a little problem. It caused heart attacks. It took a year of Vioxx being on the market before anyone noticed the association. So what if we have, in a de-identified fashion, no privacy issues, the capacity to mine data so we can actually discover what works and what doesn't work, look at variation in care, use evidence to deliver the best practice care, right care, right patient, right time. Data in this country is not shared very well. Part of this is alignment of incentives. So you talked about aligning incentives for climate change. So imagine this. You go to the Brigham and Women's Hospital. You get an MRI for $2,500. Then you walk across the street to Beth Israel Deaconess and we do another $2,500 MRI because one man's redundancy is another man's BMW. Right? This is unfortunately the incentive that we're given today. The notion of healthcare reform is that we're going to pay for quality, not quantity, and we'll be paid for coordination of care, and therefore data sharing to remove redundant and wasteful testing will be a necessity. And all the data standards and all the technology to share that data is being put in place nationally, at a state level, and locally right now. And today, doctors' offices are a sea of paper, and we need to get them to the electronic age. We have about 1,000 iPads in use at Beth Israel Deaconess, 1,600 iPhones. The web is used extensively, but that's not necessarily true throughout a doctor's office in a rural area or in many other parts of the country. So this whole incentive program is to get everybody in a fully electronic learning healthcare system by 2015. One of the things that I do at the national level is I'm responsible for the bits and the bytes of coordinating all the data standards that allow medical records to talk to each other. Between April and September of this year, we met every three days, very painful, to develop the standards that are necessary to exchange information about medications and labs, to ensure that we could do that data analytic I talked about to learn from the healthcare system, to keep data secure, to be able to send it from point A to point B and have it not changed or intercepted. All of that was delivered to the federal government September 28th, will be baked into regulation by the end of the year, and hopefully out in final regulation by mid-2012. So the healthcare system is getting connected. We have this thing called accountable care organizations, part of healthcare reform. The idea is instead of disconnected labs and pharmacies and clinics and hospitals like we have today, that the community will come together and care about your wellness, that will coordinate your care across to different providers. All of that takes two kinds of technologies, data sharing, as I already talked about, and powerful analytic platforms. So where I work, Beth Israel Deaconess and its affiliates, we are working to become an accountable care organization. So some of the things that we've worked on 
are creating this healthcare data exchange by which, as you see a doctor, when you leave the hospital or an office, summary of that information is sent to a central repository securely using internet technologies and lots of audit trails so that then in a quality data center we can look at the care you've experienced across your lifetime. And this is making sure you got the right care. If you're a diabetic, did you have an eye exam? Did you have your laboratories measured and are they of the sort of right direction? Are they going in the right, right place? We've built a variety of analytics that now combine data from multiple sources across the community and then enable us to give doctors feedback on the care they're delivering to you. It's, of course, a perfect IT slide, lightning bolts, clouds, and things you can't read. But there's a lot of government reporting of quality we also do. We're being held accountable for what we're doing with the notion that we'll get paid for outcomes and wellness and not just more testing. Okay. One of the challenges we have in medicine is we're all trained as apprentices. So I trained at Harbor UCLA Medical Center in Southern California 20 years ago. And today, if you come to see me in the emergency department and you have the worst headache of life, I'm going to order a head CT. Is it because that's the right thing to do? No, it's because 20 years ago, that's what my chief resident told me would be a good idea. Alas, Every doctor learns anecdotally, not based on evidence and not based on learning from the whole healthcare system. That has to change. So one aspect of this meaningful use is getting to decision support systems. When you come to the hospital and we look at you as a person and your unique characteristics, we should be able to mine the evidence and come up with a course of treatment that we think is going to be safe and efficacious. So we've started to do this at the hospitals that I work at where we have thousands of rules, we mine the literature. When you come for a head CT, we say, oh, well, are you allergic to shellfish? There could be contrast material given to you. If you're allergic to shellfish, you could develop an allergic reaction to contrast. Are you claustrophobic? Oh, MRI is not so good for somebody who's claustrophobic. Have you had a lot of radiation exposure in your life? Oh, we need to think about you as a person and your experience. And then we'll present to the doctor, here is a rank ordered list, safe, reliable testing you can do. You can't do a total body MRI on a person with toe pain. No, here's what you should do. And you can pick. It's not what I'll call cookbook medicine, but it's giving the clinician guidance based on evidence and then allowing choice within a range of sanity. That's what we should do in all sites of care. Well, I've talked a little bit about learning healthcare system. Now, what does this mean? So here's the challenge. 5,000 hospitals in the United States, 500,000 doctors, all are silos of data. What if we decide, hmm, you know, I actually think people with blonde hair and blue eyes get diabetes less frequently than people with brown hair. I don't know. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Today, it takes years to answer such a question. Millions of dollars, huge amounts of bureaucracy. What if, without compromising patient privacy by pooling data in central databases, I mean, imagine we all put our medical records in the basement of the White House, Sarah Palin runs it, it's going to be great. Uh, <laughs> no. Instead, what we do is we send the question to the data. Oh, that's easy. So doctor's office has 100 diabetics. A question arrives electronically in a very well-constrained form. So it's a computer that answers the question, not a human. It says, of those 100 patients, how many have blonde hair and how many have brown hair? And it returns a number. Ah, 60 and 40. OK, well, no one's privacy is going to get compromised when all that is exchanged over the internet is 60 and 40. You know, it's no person identified information. If you could do this across every hospital and doctor's office and get an answer in 30 seconds, you could have discovered the relationship of Vioxx and chest pain a year before hundreds of people had to die. You could discover P3 
people with SARS, H1N1, infectious disease would be detected much more rapidly and evidence could be considered as to what drugs work for what patients. We've started to do this at Harvard. We have 17 hospitals associated with Harvard. They don't actually like each other very much. They don't necessarily work together that well, but they do share data. We've created this web-based approach that allows us to navigate concepts in medicine to create questions and then launch those questions and within 30 seconds get answers. Okay, let's look at a disease. How does that disease distribute by age? Well, that's an interesting question. Okay, we can look at that. How does a disease process or a therapy vary over time? Ah, we can look at that. What if we wanted to compare two different groups of patients by hair color? Or I made that up, but I mean, or some other characteristic, the medication they're taking or another disease they may have. Well, we can look at that. This is all done without sending person-identified data outside of the four walls of a protected hospital or doctor's office. A query is generated, goes over the internet securely, goes behind the firewall, the question is answered, and the numbers are sent back. And so we've done this. We've done, can, uh, Children's Hospital Partners Healthcare Care Group do it today. We can generate a query of arbitrary complexity and send it around. Now, of course, you, you may ask a, one privacy question. You know, maybe, hmm, I'll pick on somebody else. Your next door neighbor is a little unusual. Your next door neighbor has a blue eye and a green eye, one leg, and you think they're a little crazy. So you're going to generate the query, show me in Boston all green-eyed, blue-eyed, one-legged people with psychiatric disorders. You would be able to violate that individual's privacy by creating a query that was so constrained. So what do we do? Whenever the numbers returned are very small, we add an arbitrary random number to the result so that you could never uniquely identify a single person with any query. And so protect privacy, enhance learning, and do this with the existent data systems we have today, just a unique way of sending questions over the internet and computers being able to respond to. So I blog every day, uh, Monday through Wednesday, technology and policy, Thursday, always something personal. Today's, for example, was reflecting on my daughter's first two months at college and not what she's learned, but what she has become as she's become an independent young woman. And Friday is an emerging technology, so tomorrow I'll be looking at droid phones, which is best. So, and I live by email, so always look forward to questions. So thanks very much.